Now that we have our battle class, let's make the combat logic a little more interesting. We'll start by adding a dexterity property to the living entity class, so we can use it in both the monster and the player. Then we'll create a new combat service class, and we'll make changes in uh, several other classes. Eleven of them, if I counted correctly. The first thing we'll do is open Visual Studio and modify the Living Entity class in the Engines Project and Model Subdirectory. We'll add a new backing variable, underscore dexterity, that will back this new property on lines 31 through 39, the dexterity property. You'll probably notice on line 33 for the getter, I changed that to a lambda instead of having the open curly brace, get semicolon, close curly brace. And I also did that with the other getters in this class. That's just kind of the new style. It doesn't really make any difference, but it looks a little cleaner to me, so I'm going to go with that. After we add the new property, we have to go down to the constructor on lines 141 and 142, add a new integer dexterity parameter so we can pass a parameter in when we construct the object. And then on 145, we'll set the passed in value for dexterity to the property dexterity. Now that we've modified the living entity constructor, we have to go to its child classes and add in this new dexterity parameter. We'll start by going to the player class and go down to lines 45 through 47. On the constructor, we'll add in a new int dexterity parameter. And when it calls the base, we'll make sure we pass in that dexterity in the right place. And while we're in here, I'm going to use the lambdas for the getters on line 26 and on line 16. That's all we need to do for the player class. So we'll go into the monster class next. And for this class, we're also going to add a new int dexterity parameter on the constructor and pass in the dexterity value to the base class, the living entity constructor. In order to put in values, we'll go to the monsters.xml file in engine game data. And I added a new child node for each monster, dexterity with a value. For these values, I'm going to use values between 3 and 18, kind of like the old Dungeons and Dragons game where you would roll three six-sided dice and total them up. And I just arbitrarily said a rat is going to have a dexterity of 8, a giant spider has a dexterity of 12, and a snake has a dexterity of 15. I could have added the dexterity as another attribute up here in the monster node, but I think we're going to get a lot of different values. We're going to probably have strength, health, constitution, uh, intelligence, things like that. So I think we don't want to just have a long list of attributes. Instead, we'll have a list that goes down with all the new attribute values. Either way works. I'm just trying to do something that I think will look a little bit nicer and e be easier to read in the future. Now that we have this new dexterity node, we have to go into the monster factory so we can read the value and pass that into the monster constructor. At the top of the monster factory class, add in using system, because now we have to do a math conversion, and that's in the system namespace. And then down on line 50, I added this new convert to int 32, the node select single value dexterity. This is what's going to read the dexterity, and the inner text is that 12, 15, 8, whatever the number is. It's going to convert that to an integer and pass that into the monster constructor's new dexterity parameter. So now our monster should be good. We also have to go into the trader class because the trader is another living entity child object. And we just need to make sure we pass in a value to the base constructor, the living entity constructor for the dexterity. I'm putting in an 18, I'm just hard coding it because right now you can't fight a trader, so it doesn't really matter what value we pass in. That's something we may change in the future, but this is good for right now. Then we have to go into game session in engine view models. And in the constructor of game session, we instantiate the current player. On line 122, get a random number between three and 18. That's going to be the player's dexterity and pass that in to the player constructor. So that way it will be passed into the living entity constructor and there in the dexterity property. 
So now we have the living entity, the new dexterity property, and all of its children, the monster, trader, and player, are populating the dexterity with a value. We can go into the logic for the combat now. In the engine project in the services folder, I created a new combat service class. The first thing I did was I took the combatant enum out of the battle class and put it here in combat service. It really doesn't matter where it is. I just think it fits a little bit better here. And I created two new functions. The first attacker function, which is the new version that we used to have in the battle class and attack succeeded. The first attacker function is a lot more complex than the previous one was. What I did was I found a formula on the internet and I modified it until I was happy with it. What we're going to do is take the player's dexterity and square it, subtract the monster's dexterity that's been squared, divide the difference by 10, and then we're going to apply a random value between minus 10 and positive 10, and that's going to be an offset. We're going to apply that to the 50 because the kind of the base chance is going to be 50-50, and we're going to use that to determine if the player is the first attacker or if the monster is. And before I actually did this, I went into Excel and I created a spreadsheet where I tested out different values of the player's dexterity against the monster's dexterity to see what it would calculate out to and make sure I was happy with the range. So here, if the player's dexterity is 12 and the monster's dexterity is anything from 3 to 18, I've got the offset we're going to apply. And then I checked the, the far ranges. If the player's dexterity was 3 against all the monster dexterities, or if the player's dexterity was 18 against all the different monster dexterities, just to make sure this range doesn't go over 100 or under 0. I want to make sure there's always a chance that an attacker can hit or can miss. So I'll go through the formula now. To do the square, I basically calculate the player's dexterity times the player's dexterity, put it in a variable, then I get the monster's dexterity times itself, put that in a variable, subtract the opponent's dexterity from the players, divide that by 10, and the m just means this 10 is a decimal value. It's not a an integer value because our other variables are integers. If I didn't do this, then this may calculate as an, an integer and drop that decimal values, which I want to keep around. Then I pick a random number between minus 10 and 10, and I add the dexterity offset that we calculated to the random offset, then pick a random number between 0 and 100. If it's less than 50 plus that offset, so that offset's going to be that range of 31.5 to minus 31.5, plus or minus the 10, if the random number is less than that number, then the player is the first attacker. If the random number is higher than that number, then the opponent is. So what's going to happen is if the player has a much higher dexterity than the monster, they're going to be more likely to be the first attacker. If the player has a much lower dexterity than the monster, then the monster is going to have a much higher chance of being the first attacker because it's going to be 50 plus a negative number. If you're not sure about this formula, what you can do is set a breakpoint, like right here on line 17, run the game and step through this, and you'll see how the different variables get calculated and how it affects the result. Now on lines 28 through 40, I created an attack succeeded function, which takes in a living entity of the attacker and a living entity of the target. The logic here is all the same, and it returns a Boolean value as to whether the attack succeeded, yes or no. Right now, the logic is the same. In the future, we're going to add some more offsets when we start to have attack and defense skills, armor, weapon bonuses, enchantments, curses, things like that. Normally, if you have duplicated code, you'd want to create one function that gets used by both of these but I know that we're going to be modifying this soon, so I'm just going to leave the duplicate calculations in here for these two functions. Now that we have our combat service functions, we can go into the battle class. 
What we're going to do in here first is delete the combatant enum and the first attacker function. Those were on lines 13 through 23. And then we'll go down to the constructor, line 27, where we used to call that first attacker function that was local. And we're going to call it from the combat service now. So now it's going to say if the combat service first attacker equals opponent, then the opponent's going to attack the player. The final bit of logic we need to change is in the attack with weapon function that's in the engine project in the actions subdirectory, because now we're going to use the combat service, that new combat service attack succeeded to determine if the player hit the monster or if the monster hit the player. Go down to the execute function and we're going to change the logic, the order of it a little bit. So now it's going to say, if combat service attack succeeded from the actor to the target, the attacker to the target, then we're going to determine the damage. It's going to be the random number between the minimum damage and the maximum damage, report the message, and we're going to have the target take damage. Otherwise, so if the attack did not succeed, then we're going to say the actor missed the target. Same basic logic, but we've changed it around a little bit. Before, in this function, we used to calculate the damage, and if the amount of damage was zero, then we considered that a miss. What we want to do now that we have this attack succeeded function is we want to make sure the damage is not zero, because if you did successfully hit something, you want to do at least one point of damage. So we'll go into the game items XML file and the three weapons that used to have a minimum damage of zero, we're going to change that to one. So now if you, if the monster succeeds in attacking you, it's going to do at least one point of damage. Since we added the new dexterity property, let's go into the main window.xaml and in the player stats section that begins on line 32, we'll add another row and then we'll add two labels on that row that will say dexterity and then it will bind to the current player's dexterity. So you can see the actual amount. I put them here on row two, so I had to bump the other rows down by one value. And now after creating or modifying at least a dozen files, we can test this out. One thing I did was in the test project, I created a new test combat service class it lets me create a player and a monster with whatever dexterity values I want, call the combat service first attacker function and see what the results are. If you notice, I don't have an assertion in here because we have that random number. I can't really say that the first attacker function is deterministic. I, part of assertion is you know that the input values if you put in the same input values every time, you're going to get the same output values every time. With a function that does random numbers, we don't know that. So we call the function non-deterministic because I could put in this player and monster and based on what the random numbers are, sometimes the player is going to win, sometimes the monster is going to win. So I don't have any assertions here, but I do have this as a way for me to set the debugger and then go and say, run with the debugger. That lets me step through the code and make sure that the calculations are coming out the way I think they should, which for me is good enough for my test. Now let's go and actually run the game. We'll see that the player's dexterity is 13. Let's go north and we'll fight a snake. The snake hit us the first time, so it won that first attacker function. We'll use our pointy stick on it. And we won, but the battle was a little bit longer than normal. That's because our dexterity is 13 and the snakes, if I remember correctly, is 15. So the snake should have a little bit of an edge against us. We keep fighting, we keep fighting. Let's go west and fight the rat. The rat should be a little bit easier because its dexterity is eight. Let's 
see here the the rat missed us the rat missed us we were hitting so we're so we're hitting the rat more often than the rat is hitting us what you can also do is run the program a few times and eventually you'll come up with a very low dexterity or a very high dexterity so let's go fight that snake now the snake hit us for two points so it got the first attack and it hit us we missed the snake and the snake hit us we missed the snake again and the snake hit us we missed the snake this time the snake missed us so you can see if we have a dexterity of six and we're fighting a snake with a dexterity of 15 we're going to have a much tougher battle in fact we may get killed and that's going to be it for this lesson. I think most of the things were pretty simple and straightforward, other than that combat service calculation. If you find your own calculation, just make sure you put it in a spreadsheet and you test all the different values. You want to make sure that there's always at least a small chance of being successful or of missing with any sort of calculation like this. And I'll pull up the project plan that should finish out this complex combat logic for right now. The next two features I want to add are leveling logic, so we have some better leveling logic, and the save and load game to disk. What I'm going to do is move the save and load game to disk up to the next feature to add. We can add this leveling logic anytime. As always, if you're watching the video on YouTube, there'll be links in the description to the support page where you can get the source code and to the Discord channel and to the GitHub repository if you just want to view the changes there or get the code there. If you have any questions, please leave it below the video or on the support page and I'll get back to you as soon as possible.